Welcome to the Compounders Podcast, where we explore the anatomy of public company wealth creation stories. On this show, we invite you to be a fly on the wall for the actual conversations professional investors have with public company CEOs. Through a series of interviews, we will learn about how to create a compounder, a sustainable company whose success builds upon itself by hearing about the real life experiences of public company leaders. I'm your host, Ben Claremont, a partner and portfolio manager at Cove Street Capital. In these conversations, I interview public company senior executives by posing the exact kind of questions I ask as part of Cove Street's diligence process. By talking to people who operate within a wide variety of industries, we will dig into the holistic aspects of company building that you are not going to hear anywhere else. Whether you are a professional investor, founder, or someone who is simply interested in business, we think this podcast has something for you. All opinions expressed by your hosts and the podcast guests are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Cove Street Capital or any affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not investment advice and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending the purchase or sale of any securities. The hosts and guests may be beneficial owners of the securities discussed. You should not assume that the securities discussed are or will be profitable. My guest on the show today is Tom Gaynor, the co-CEO of Markel Corporation. Markel is a $16.7 billion market cap financial holding company that primarily operates in the insurance and reinsurance industry. Though Tom has only been in the co-CEO seat since 2016, he has been with Markel for close to 30 years, and he has been an investor longer than that. Markel has been compared to Berkshire Hathaway in both structure and performance, and Tom has been a key architect of the company's diversification away from insurance through the acquisition of operating businesses. In fact, Markel Ventures has gone from $1.2 billion in revenue in 2016 to about $2.8 billion today. Tom is well known in the value investing community for his charm and intellect. Also, many people who have made the trek to Omaha for the Berkshire shareholder meeting have also attended the Markel breakfast event. I had the opportunity to listen to Tom speak a number of times in Omaha, and that is why I thought he'd be a great guest on the podcast. In this conversation, we will cover his thoughts on what makes a compounder, the value of having a Quaker upbringing, how to invest more like his grandmother than a Wall Street trader, and why he's a better investor because he's a CEO and vice versa. Before we start, just a couple of disclosures to note. Tom is a longtime friend of Cove Street's founder, Jeff Bronchick and Cove Street is not currently a Markel shareholder. And without further ado, here's my discussion with Markel Corp co-CEO, Tom Gaynor. I like to start this podcast at pivotal moments in the company's history. Let's go back to March, 2009. The stock has been cut in half from its peak in late 2007. The financial world is crumbling. The S&P is below 700. There are all kinds of questions about the potential impact of the bank's issues on non-financial businesses across the US. Access to capital for all businesses was up in the air. To the best of your recollection, what kind of conversations were you guys having internally at Markel at that time? Well, Ben, thanks for, uh, for having me. And that's an interesting question. And the first caveat that I would offer is that I, I, I think sometimes memory should not be trusted because uh, when I think back to March 2009 and some of the pain that would have been part and parcel of that process, the truth is I probably would have blacked out and repressed some of those memories of that time. So I'm not sure how accurate my, my answers would be. But with that as a, as a caveat, and it, it is different than some of the other times when there have been moments of, of stress and challenge in financial markets, um, I, I, my memory of that is that while there were some really tough things I was pretty optimistic and and thinking that things would be okay at, at the time, and a couple of couple of components to that. So first off, the epicenter of that problem tended to be in the banking business um, and the subprime mortgages and things of that nature. Our exposure and ownership of banks at that time was not zero, but it it wasn't very much. There weren't a whole lot of things that that we owned um, in, the, in the banking world. So somehow or another, whether through luck or just some concern about a bunch of 
credit worthiness kinds of issues, we tended not to have a, a, a lot of exposure to that world. Now, among the things that we did own, not in size, but certainly we owned, and I, I certainly uh, felt it to some degree. I mean, we owned Citicorp, and in rough terms, we would have owned that at 51, 52, and the stock got to where it was 26. And on the way down, this is pre the reverse split stuff, um, you know, it went, it went down to a dollar or, or less at the depths of things. I remember selling our Citicorp at 26, so basically a, a 50% loss, and, and just the sensation that there's something going on here, which I do not understand. This is a storm that I don't know what the dimensions of it are, so I just need to get out of the way of it. Um, now, that said, at the same time, the insurance business compared to the banking business, I thought was fundamentally in a way better position in that, you know, an in insurance for a policyholder to get money out of the insurance company, it's because some something bad would have happened. There would have been a loss. There would have been a fire. There would have been all of those sorts of things. So you don't have the same dynamic where there's the run on the bank possibility where the customers say, look, I just don't... Uh, trust you as a financial institution anymore. So give me my money back. That that can exist in banking. It doesn't exist in the same way in insurance. So the fact that our largest business was insurance and that we were still selling insurance and there were no run on the bank kind of issues involved, um, that, that gave me a little more confidence at the time. And then the third memory, and this might fall in the category of mystic glow of memory of things that, that worked out great. So you remember them well. I remember thinking, um, you know, housing was under question and mortgages and just sort of real estate related things were, uh, were, were under a dark cloud. Well, uh, as a homeowner and someone who sometimes has been confronted with spending money on my house, not because I'm trying to improve it, but because I'm trying to keep it from falling down and, and just the degree of maintenance that a house that you already own requires, um, we ended up buying a fair amount of Home Depot stock at the time uh, and a, a smaller but meaningful holding in Lowe's as well. And my thinking at that time was, look, I, I think these businesses are going to be fine. And there's a lot of times I spend money on my house. I don't want to spend it, but I have to. And those were the two vendors that oftentimes were um, the places where that spending took place. So I thought those were pretty good businesses. I thought they'd be way better than what people might have thought. So my memories are not trustworthy about 2009, but those are those are three that I do distinctly remember from that time. Yeah, th those are interesting takes, and and I wonder, and, and this is you know it speaks to you know a business that's got you know family family controlled and, and family managed for so long. But do you feel like there was a something about the Markel franchise and that the, the longevity of, of of that you know the, the family's orientation there? that allowed you to sleep better, allowed you to just feel more confident about putting capital to work versus, you know, you're working, you're working in another organization where, you know, you don't quite have that, that history and that legacy and the family involvement. Yes, I think that's very much the case. And I wouldn't tie that specifically to the 0809 financial crisis, but really more that that's just the fundamental ethos of the way the business is run and always had been run. And in fact, I was in a conversation with somebody earlier today, and we were reminiscing a bit, not about 08, 09, but 98, 99. And the, and the you know, dot-com 1.0 was rocking and rolling at that particular time. And I started here in 1990. And fortunately, the first several years, the investment performance was very good. And that really gave me a fair amount of sort of credibility and staying power to be able to last through a time that might not look quite so good. And when we got to 98 or 99, I was underperforming the market by the biggest margin I ever have in my whole life. It, it was a rough time and I couldn't, I couldn't make heads or tails out of what was going on. And I had a monthly meeting with Steve Markell, who I was working for, he's my boss. And we would review on a regular basis, some of the major things we owned, why we owned them, uh, new product developments, management issues, just fundamental basic things about the largest companies in our portfolio. At that time in 98 or 99, when I, I looked probably dumber than I really was, 
uh, I started adding four or five companies that we didn't own, as well as the ones that we did own. And I would talk about the same kind of things, management teams, new products, sales, revenues, news items. And at the end of those meetings, every month, Steve would look at me and he would say, I understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I understand what you're not doing and why you're not doing it. Makes sense to me. See you next month. So I tell that story because I think it was a first rate display of leadership and, and keeping your moorings when things were um, sort of calibrated in ways that we didn't have good markers for. Uh, but it also speaks to that ethos that you, that you referenced, that if you have this just long-term multi-generational time frame that you're working with, it helps you stay a little calmer about any given day. Uh, don't get too exuberant or, or excited when things are going well. Don't get too depressed when they aren't, because in the long arc of time, if you're acting reasonably and thoughtfully and with discipline and normal, appropriate prudence and diligence, it's going to work out fine. Um, and and I, I think the 98, 99 time frame, having already been here, eight or nine, that happened. And then 10 years further down the road, when you get to the 08, 09 time frame, it just infuses the way people think around here. Got it. And, you know, I wasn't going to dig too deep into what you're thinking at the moment, but I do think it dovetails well into a next question. Do you, do you think there are parallels to the today's market where you're scratching your head a little bit in a similar way? Um, you know, not, maybe not necessarily underperforming in the same, to the same degree, but just scratching your head. Like you see things that you just don't quite understand. Are there, are there some things out there that are, reminiscent of that 98, 99 period for you? Yes. And I know you probably wanted a more substantive answer than that. I just wanted to demonstrate that I am capable of giving a short, succinct answer sometimes, not, not a long one. But uh, yes, uh, I do think there are a lot of things in today's market that caused me to, to scratch my head, not the least of which is, and, and this is very important, pervading a lot of things is, is just the general level of interest rates and that interest rates are, are this low, not only in the U S but around the world. Um, and having sort of graduated from college and entered the working world almost right at the peak of, you know, the, the interest rate cycle of a generation. And I think my first mortgage might've been at 15 and some percent for the, for the first house that I bought. And my children have mortgages in the threes. Uh, it's just stunning to me. Um, that, that exposure of what a market was like when you saw interest rates at double digit levels and inflation galloping through makes it hard for me to process what the world is like when you have interest rates at one and a half or two, or in, in some cases, negative. And I think all kinds of behaviors flow from the structure of interest rates being where they are. And, and one way I describe it is the sense that <clears throat> the level of interest rates is like an inverse correlation to curfew. So if interest rates are really, really high, like they were when I graduated from college in 1983, that's like having curfew at six o'clock at night. Not much is going to happen because the standards are very, very high. And, you know, you're going to come home, you're going to do your homework, you're going to eat, and you're done. You're not going to get yourself in trouble with a 6pm curfew. And at each level that interest rates come down, you know, that curfew went to seven o'clock. Well, what's going to happen if you have a seven o'clock, so you get to go outside, and shoot some baskets with your friends a little bit after dinner, not much. And they keep coming down, curfew gets to eight, nine, 10, behavior start to change. And then when it gets to 11 or, or midnight, well, the behaviors change a lot. And in the current environment that we operate in, I would say there is effectively no curfew, no rules. So all kinds of things can take place. And if you, if you have an idea and you can pitch an idea well, you're going to get capital. 
There's, there's just capital sloshing around uh, the marketplace. Some of those will prove to be spectacularly successful and they will be life-changing companies and, and really uh, companies that we will know of for, for a long time, but not many. Uh, there'll be a whole lot more people that will try than will succeed at, at, that, at that sort of stuff. So that would be one of the ways in which uh, I sort of have a, a memory of things like the, the late 90s, where for a particular segment of the market, there was as much capital as you wanted. And when there is as much capital as you want, without much in the way of constraints or gating factors, people are going to grab it and try to go for it. That's what they should do in those sort of environments, but that doesn't necessarily work out well for the investors. So just try to be cognizant of that sensation. You, you tell this wonderful story about your grandmother who owned the same stocks forever because she didn't make any changes to her, her life after <laughs> her husband passed. And as a result, she saw incredible compounding. And, and so given what you just said and that there's all this temptation and there's all this capital and there's all, a lot of shiny objects out there, you know, for a seasoned guy like yourself, maybe there's a fair amount of, um, I guess, restraint. But how within an organization of people who are looking at either whether it's acquisitions within Markel Ventures or even in the equity portfolio, how do you infuse, um, you know, people lower in the organization with your grandmother's philosophy? H how would you do that? Well, I think one of the ways, so there, and, and basically that is a lifelong quest to develop the temperament and the wisdom and the patience to, to be able to ride a winner for a long period of time. But speaking of a winner for a long period of time, think about Amazon and think about what Jeff Bezos wrote. I think it was in this last year's annual report where I, he talked about people keep asking him all the time, you know, what's next and what's going to change and what's going to be different. And he talked about his think about the things that would not change and not be different. And specifically for Amazon, he talked about being better, faster, and cheaper. And he was pretty sure that no matter what happened in any kind of technological change or anything that was going on, customers would still want things to be better. They would want it to be faster, want it to be cheaper. Those were enduring factors, no matter what went on in technology. So to your question is, how do you keep an organization focused on that sort of thing and keeping the long term in mind? I think framing the question you're trying to answer is, is very important. And as Bezos did in, in his letter there, uh, it wasn't pick, predicting the next new, new thing and what was going to happen technologically. It was saying, we want to operate in such a way that our customers keep getting things that are better, faster and cheaper. And we will use and adopt whatever new things come along in order to be able to deliver on that promise. And I, I, I just think uh, getting back to first principles is, uh, is very helpful in that. Got it, got it. Um, I, um, when I was thinking about this interview and, and, and the, our discussion, you know, there's, there's like CIO Tom Gaynor and there's CEO Tom Gaynor. And I wanna get to know a little bit the CEO Tom Gaynor a little bit better um, because I think that's an interesting, you know, it, it's an interesting co role that you have is the co-CEO role. So maybe we'll move on to, you know, from investing to talk a little bit more about, you know, the, you know, being the business, the business side. So what do you think you've learned about leadership being a co-CEO that you might not have learned if you were simply just a chief investment officer who was focused on public investments? Right. Well, uh, a lot of things, and among them is how hard it is to really run a good business. Um, Buffett made the statement a long time ago where he said, being an investor made him a better businessman, and being a businessman made him a better investor. I think that is epically true, and I'm very fortunate and lucky to be able to sit in the seat where I do, where I get to have both those roles as a fundamental component of, of my job every single day. And for instance, getting back to your earlier question about my grandmother's holding periods, well, I have more, of, because of my CEO responsibilities and because I'm res responsible for operating businesses and people and plants and factories and distribution systems and things of that nature, and I have appreciation for how hard it is to do that really, really, really well, 
when I find uh, an investment in a company that we're passive owners of just owning the shares, and I observe and see and gain some conviction and belief that that management team is doing it well, well, you know what? They're going to get the benefit of the doubt from me. They're going to get a longer leash. I will, I will be understanding if they stumble or go through more difficult periods than I might have been if I was just looking at isolated numbers on a spreadsheet or the two-dimensional reality of staring at the computer screen rather than the three-dimensional real reality of actual human beings with red blood flowing through their, through their blood cells. Also, um, that ties to the notion of valuation, and Steve Markel teases me about this uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, sometimes there's something that you bought and, and it works well, and the valuation might have, you know, the price might have gone up a bit from what it was when you first bought it. That's a good thing. Well, the idea of setting a price target, and if this thing that I'm fundamentally right about gets to X price or 2X what I bought it for or whatever that I'm going to sell, my tendency to do that today versus what would have been the case 10, 20, 30 years ago is a lot, lot less um, because they have appreciation for the management teams and, and what they're doing. Um, and I'm, I'm willing to let valuations run a bit more, way, way more than I would have in the, in the past, just because I, I have that front row seat of, of how hard that is to do. No, it's interesting that you bring that up. It's like you develop more empathy, I think, than you do when you're sitting in our seat where you're just looking at 18,000 feet and you see, you know, underperformance of some kind or miss, you know, something that looks like missed capital allocation. And, you know, you, you know, you just you think it's malice versus just, you know, maybe things take time, maybe something went wrong. It's just you develop a, a sense of, of the pace of business and the pace of change that you just can't have um, when you're just reading financial statements and, and, and listening to conference calls. Yeah, I think that's very, very true. And, and again, I can't tell you how much more of a, a visceral sense I have of business today being responsible for 20,000 lives, 20,000 employees and their livelihood and taking care of their families and supporting their communities. Um, and, I, and I know firsthand how sincere their efforts are and how hard they're working and just trying to do the best they can. And when you, you, when you find forces of groups of people, which all, in, all businesses are, are groups of people um, that are working basically in reasonable alignment and basically making the world a better place, I, I have a lot of time and, and empathy and understanding and grace uh, for people who I, I think are, are doing a, um, as good a job as, as they know how to do. Now, some missions are doomed. There's some businesses which are structurally just flawed. And, and again, as Buffett would, would say, if, uh, if you have a, a, good biz, a, a good management team trying to take over a bad business, it is the reputation of the business that will survive. He, he's correct. There are some wonderful people that might be engaged in somewhat futile efforts uh, just because the structure of the industry or the, or the business is, is not one where you can make very good returns. He talks about a lot in his own history with the, with the textile business. Um, but barring that and finding people who are engaged in reasonable, reasonable businesses or businesses that are getting better over time, um, your, your patience really develops when you've been responsible for tr trying to find those sorts of companies, get them on board, uh, and how hard the people are working. I want to stick with the people topic because for us, you know, we have three pillars of our investment strategy, business value and people. And over my decade here, I've learned that the people part is probably the most important thing. And if there's anything I could impart to young investors, like pay attention to people. So, um, you talk a lot about integrity and how important it is for you to invest alongside good people. I assume that's also true when you're hiring people and figuring out who to promote. Um, and so just sorry for a little digression, but I, I teach a class every year to the Ben Graham Value Investing Program students at UCLA. And, and my class is about how to determine if a management team is a friend or a foe. And the takeaway from that class is pretty simple. 
it's really hard to do. And so I'd love to hear your advice um, on, on trying to understand whether it's someone you're hiring, whether they have, they share your values or, you know, the manager of one of the, uh, the, the, sorry, the Markel Ventures companies has the integrity and the values that you, that you like, or even a public company CEO you're meeting for the first time. Like any wisdom that you can share that you've learned over the years to, to determine what is very qualitative and hard to do. Well, um, I, I share your statement that it is hard to do and maybe to, to, uh, go back to the Charlie Munger inversion technique. All right. So if it's so hard to do, what could we spot or see or tell us that we're dealing with a person who's not the kind of person we want. And if you look at somebody who, um, you know, has a, has a pay package that you can find through the proxy that seems disproportionate. Now, by the way, I, I'm a CEO. I'm very grateful for, for, for what I get paid. Uh, and I think that, when you think about the burdens and the responsibilities of, of what it means to be C CEO, uh, it's a job that should have some compensation to it and some meaningful compensation to it. Not, not wildly differently than what you might see professional athletes uh, get paid. So there are things that would seem within the realm of reason that I would observe. When I see things that are beyond the realm of reason, and that's a judgment call, that causes me some question. Uh, you're, you're looking at somebody who just celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary. So I, I married my high school sweetheart. Now say what you will. Uh, different people have different things about them or things that, that matter to them. For me, uh, someone who has demonstrated loyalty for decades, that's, that's a good thing. Somebody who's on their seventh wife, hmm. I, I would, I would wonder about that. What, what did wives one through six know about that person? That uh, if if I knew what they knew, would I want to be that person's partner in business? There's there's things like that. There's there's lifestyle. There's there's tales. Uh, there's the there's the writing. Uh, so reading the shareholders' letters um, is the message consistent over time? Has somebody been in the job for a long enough period of time that they've really Given you a couple laps around the track and uh, been through some good times, been through some bad times, and done what they said they would do. Uh, th those are all things that go into the the just the overall labyrinth of, of how does you make judgments about um, your degree of comfort with another human being. And by the way, none of that is ever going to be a zero or a hundred. Those extremes don't exist. We are all human beings and we're all flawed. What you want is to be in the, the 80th percentile plus. And if you can find that and accept the flaws that, that people have, um, you know, like my wife has with me, she has stuck. She, you know, I've stuck with her, but you know what? She stuck with me too. And I'm not a perfect person. So I, I, I like um, teasing out those kinds of details and figuring out uh, those sorts of behaviors, which are indicative not perfect, but indicative to me. So even if you're really good at hiring as a company, you know, when you have 20,000 employees, there are inevitably going to be some people who are, you know, are, are on that spec on a side of a spectrum that you don't really want and maybe are willing to bend the rules. And so Buffett has this saying that, you know, Berkshire has hundreds of thousands of employees. And that basically means that every moment at every day that there's at least one person who's doing something he or she shouldn't. So I'm interested, how do you think culture can, you know, how you could build a culture that mitigates or limits the number of people who have a desire, who are just a little bit towards that spectrum of maybe trying to bend the rules? Well, um, it's, it's a tough challenge. And again, it's no, nothing that you're ever going to be 100% on, uh, but you try to clearly, I think you have a couple of responsibilities. One is you should try to, clearly articulate what it is you're for. And at Markel, we talk about the hire to build one of the world's great companies and the win, win, win architecture, where we want our customers to be better off because they did business with them. So we've made somebody's life better by virtue of the fact that they were a customer of ours. And that speaks to 
sustainability. And if we truly make our customers better off, that means they're more likely to do business with us again next week, next month, next year. And they're more likely to refer their, their friends and, and colleagues to us as well. So we think uh, it's way better, as my friend Chad Bro would say, to do things for people than two people. So win number one is for our customers. Let's do things for our customers to make them better off. Uh, win number two, we want our employees to be better off for virtue of being part of Markel. So we want people to be challenged. We want them to learn. We want them to be able to take care of their families and help out in their communities and just be sort of pillars of the communities that they operate, which you know go hand in hand with having a, a, a good job and a productive uh, thing that you're, you're engaged in. And we think if, if we do those two things, we take care of our customers, we take care of our employees, our shareholders win too. Now, the, the next dimension I would add to that in terms of how you sustain the culture and how you make it build and grow is that that happens over time. So as the CEO and, and someone setting some of these goals and articulating the values of this company, it is extraordinarily important to make sure you're talking about forever and the long term and the duration of this, not this quarter, the, this month. We're, we're not going to try to, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to put ourselves under extraordinary pressure to hit some number this quarter uh, that would come at the expense of our long term values. So that means being willing to accept volatility, being willing to accept the normal ebbs and flows that would happen in anyone's business and anyone's life and just have some confidence as, as a management team that we're on the right track. We're doing the right things. Not every day does it look as though that's a win, but it's the right thing to do. And we're all mature enough and we've been here long enough and we've seen enough cycles to have some sensation of that and, and don't take any shortcuts that try to produce an outcome quicker than, than what it would otherwise naturally occur. I think that's, that's a perfect segue into the next question. So, so this podcast is called Compounders, which the, you know, the idea of a business <coughs> and a culture that you know, gets, you know, gets larger and bigger and, 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 and able to um, sustain itself um, in, in a nonlinear fashion. And so I, I wonder, as you think about messaging to people across the organization, I mean, you talk about talking about, you know, focusing people on the long term and you know, making them not, not think about taking short, shortcuts, but do you need an articulated strategy about, you know, compounding like this? We need to have this idea that if we do X, Y, and Z, we can, we can, you know, just sustain this business or is it more of a take it day by day? Or do you think it's a, com a balance of the two where there's a bottom up and a top down um, approach to getting people to, um, you know, think about the long term. Yeah, um, I would not call the idea of a top-down articulated strategy and a bottom-up day by day uh, as opposing goods. They, they are not trade-offs from one to the other. You and I, because we operate in the financial world and we're comfortable with the math of what compounding means, use that term and it resonates and it makes sense to us. There are other people doing wonderful things in this company that compounding is just not part of their, their daily ritual. So that word doesn't have the emotional resonance that it, that it does for you and me. But that person almost, I, I think, regardless of what they do in Markel, the idea that, okay, this is what we're doing. What do we need to do to be a little bit better at it tomorrow? Not, not massively, but just incrementally, how do we get better? And Everybody, I mean, all 20,000 people at Markel, this I feel pretty comfortable about, know that we talk about the idea of just continual learning, trying to get better, incremental improvements, refinements, opt whatever you want to call it. Well, if you, if you tie that back to the math and, and you're, you know, 0.001% better tomorrow than you were today at whatever task you're working on, well, you are multiplying a number by some number greater than one. And if you do that long enough and persistently enough, you will hit a hockey stick some, somewhere along the way. In fact, 
you're at a hockey stick the very first day you do it. It just doesn't look that way, depending on the scale you, you talk about for your graph. But that's really what's going on. And that's compounding. So different circumstances mean you use different language. And you need to, to talk with people in language they understand. But that's compounding. And yes, we are completely, totally, 100% about that. Some of the people in Markel would call it compounding. Some of it would call it you know, looking for a better way, which is part of the Markel style, which is the creedal statement of, of Markel. Um, and now we describe ourselves, you know, we, we look for a better way. Well, why are we doing that? Because we intrinsically want to be better. And if you are intrinsically getting better, you are in fact compounding. I, I love the way you talk about that. That's, that's really interesting. And so that actually is perfect segue to my next question, which is about um, being on the board of Colfax. So Colfax has a Colfax business system, which is a derivative <laughs> of the Dan Herban business system, which is you know pretty pretty well known and well well you know, and renowned. So I'm interested. How is it possible for you, as someone who's obviously involved in Markel Ventures, but also in insurance and investing? Is it possible to, you know, for you to learn something from the Colfax business system about getting better every day? Is there, is there things that, that Markel can adopt that from a, from a system like that? Absolutely. And that's one of the great gifts and joys of being able to serve on a, on a board like Colfax. Um, they are very disciplined and methodical and quantitative in the way that they would state that process of getting better every day. And the Colfax business system is indeed the language and the overarching umbrella term they would use. Uh, and that comes from Danaher. And as Mitch or Steve Rails would, would completely um, tell you, that, that comes from Toyota and the Toyota production system. Steve Rails you know, actually moved to Japan and lived there for a while to, to study it um, and, and bring it back and base Danaher upon that. So to have a front row seat, to see a different way that the same thing is taking place and to be able to, to learn some things and adopt that discipline. It, it's flat out fun. And I think it benefits both Markel because I'm able to share some of those learnings with Markel and within the, the, the Colfax world, uh, there, there are often some insights that, that I might bring to the table that, that help Colfax. So um, as is the case with all relationships, unless relationships are mutual and both parties are, are getting something and gaining from the nature of that relationship, that relationship's going to end because it's one-sided and, and somebody's getting the short end of the stick. And the, the great part about being on a board like that is, is uh, as much as possible, um, it, it's, it's a good two-way mutual relationship where I'm learning things, but so is the, so is the company on the board I'm serving. I should mention that we are also shareholders of Colfax. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, we're familiar with Don, with Tom being on the board there. Right. Um, so to, I, I want to continue on the, um, the, the people and culture theme, because I think especially in insurance and, and it's, it's a really important thing to have, but um, so you, you work for a company where someone else's last name is on the door. It's not called Gainer Corp. It's called Markel Corp. Um, I think I have a sense of, of the benefits of working for a family owned and, you know, kind of family, either family owned or family controlled business. Um, but I'm interested also in the, you know, what, what are some of the drawbacks to, you know, that Markel not being your last name, but what do you, maybe talk about the, the, the puts and takes there of, 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 of your current situation. Right. Well, you're correct. And I appreciate the big Lebowski reference of puts and takes, um, cause there are, uh, like, like in everything. I think one of the ways in which that notion of, of what you just described has been most poignant to me in the last six months is um, at Marriott, you know, Arnie Sorensen, who was the CEO for many years, died suddenly. I believe it was pancreatic cancer. I mean, it came on fast. And, you know, in the early days of the pandemic, if you saw the video that Arnie Sorensen made for the Marriott employee network when it was just coming at them hard and Marriott clearly was a ground zero of business that was massively affected uh, 
by the, the pandemic and quarantines. That was an inspiring talk. And there is someone who has, his name was not Marriott. He did not uh, marry a Marriott. There was no Marriott blood, uh, but clearly that's a family company. Bill Marriott you know, was there when he got there. Bill Marriott was there when he left. And one of the tributes I saw paid to Arne after he died was uh, someone observing that Arne operated with great grace. And it was one of the great management stories that, that this person had ever observed uh, because he served as the CEO when the, the guy whose name is on the building is still in the building. And there are, there are elements of that which are great because it signifies and demonstrates the generational notion of things and the long-term time frame and the sense that this is not just about any one individual, but about a family and the second generation and the third generation. And as, as I talk about Markel, for instance, I, I tell people, look, I, I'm not a Markel. I have no Markel blood. I'm not married to a Markel, but I, I've been here 30 plus years now. And in fact, I would say I'm, I'm a fourth generation Markel. And that is absolutely what we're trying to inculcate and develop at the company is this sensation that when, when you come here, you are part of the family, even though that might, be, that might not be your name or your heritage or any lineage. But I want you to care about this like it is your family business. And so the fact that we are publicly traded and, and when you join, you, you, you want to be an owner of the joint, have at it. And obviously through our 401k programs and incentive programs, we, we try to incent people and have them own Markel shares. Um, to develop that that sense of this is this is your business, and I don't care whether your name is Smith or Wood or Jones or Mason or whatever, it doesn't matter. I want you, I want you to feel, I want you to feel emotionally and viscerally like you're a Markel. And one of the benefits I think about being at a company that has that that heritage and a lineage um, is that they often have what Tom Russo, the investor Tom Russo calls willingness to suffer. And so that means that you're willing to invest in the short run, um, take the pain in the short run for long-term gain. So I'd love to hear your views on where have you seen that willingness to suffer within Markel? And then maybe in hindsight, were there areas where you wish they would have been willing to suffer a little more than, 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 than they actually did? Right. Um, that's an interesting phrasing. And I've known Tom for longer than I've even been at Markel. I, I knew him, um, you know, in, in my 20s. So it's, it's 30 plus years that I've, I've known Tom. And he's uh, a very thoughtful guy and an ex extremely successful investor. And he's a, he's a good friend. Now, one of the things that uh, I, would, I would push back at him on a little bit, if we were sharing a, uh, you know, a Johnny Walker black scotch done by Diageo that he and I are both co-share owners of, is that um, when we're making a good long-term decision, I, I don't think of that as painful. And even if it has short-term expense to it, the, the reason we're, we're making that decision is because the net present value of it is positive. And anytime I'm making a net present value positive decision, and I'm, I'm reasonably good at my techniques and thoughtfulness and, and you know, it, I get it right more than wrong. If, if I'm doing those things, um, there, there's no pain associated with that. Now, where a lot of people get off the track is if they have, if there's, there's two ways, probably more, but there's two quick ways to think of where you can get off the track. If you have created expectations in earnings estimates and guidance and things of that nature, and you're going to miss earnings guidance, uh, because you're making a good long-term decision that's net present value positive, but carries short-term gap accounting costs, um, and that creates some negative outcome for you. Well, I would say you haven't designed your system well, because you should not put yourself in a position where you're exposed to that fragility and, and that weakness. And we've never provided guidance. And we don't split the stock. We've done a lot of things to try to cultivate long-term based shareholders who would look at the same decision and the same facts on the ground 
and in essence, make the same decision we would if our roles were reversed. So that, 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 that takes pain out of it. Uh, the other way in which you get yourself in trouble and might make short-term expedient decisions is if you have a lot of debt and use a lot of leverage. And it might be a situation where, look, I know in the long term, this would be the great thing to do, but I have an interest bill to pay. And I, and I, I do not have the luxury to, to, to do the long-term thing because I got a bill to pay right now. And interestingly enough, uh, to make that somewhat real, the very first company we bought for Markel Ventures was a company called AMF Baking Equipment. It was headquartered here in Richmond, and I, I knew the CEO, and that we were able to get that, which was our start down the path of Markel Ventures. And when we were looking at it, I first became aware of the possibility. You know, uh, the CEO had a presentation and the, the normal pitch book of how he would present the company to, to uh, prospective investors and whatnot. And I, I, I joked with him. And by the way, he's still the CEO of that business today, 16 years down the road, which I think is a wonderful tell. That means he did what he said he was going to do. And we did what we said we were going to do because there's a relationship that has endured for you know multiple decades now. And that's a, that's a good tell. It's a good sign. But I said, I, I don't really want to see the pitch book or anything. I, I'm an old accountant. Would you just show me the financial statements? And so he gave me the financial statements and I looked at it. And in about 14 seconds, I said, oh, this is, this is a good business with a bad balance sheet. And I know how to help on problems like that. We're going we're gonna to throw some money at it and lower the debt levels, which in essence lowers the water level, which enables them to breathe. And there, to us showing up where there was some leverage involved, um, he would have situations where maybe there was a machine that wasn't working well or an unhappy customer, and he would have an interest bill to pay at the same time. And it created tension within the business. In the very early days of our relationship with AMF, I said, I, I know that's a bad day. And I know that is a stressful day for you right now, but we're going to lower the water level. And instead of that being a bad day, I want that to be a good day. That's the day when your customer is unhappy that I want you to show up. I want you to help them. I want you to make it right. I want you to just think I'm so glad that he's doing business with you. And what will happen over time is you will develop a reputation that, look, these people do what they say they're going to do. And they stick with you thick and thin. And you'll be paid appropriately for that. And in the 17 years or so that we've now owned that business, We've seen remarkable growth, and it's, a, it's not a growth industry, but they have taken market share, and things have gone well because they've, they followed those simple precepts of you know, not putting themselves in a the box where they would be unhealthily, that's a word, tempted to take short-term expedient decisions, sometimes because we're not, we're not asking them for, what are you going to make this month, every month, and, and holding them accountable to that, but more longer term timeframes, strategically, what are we trying to do here? What are we doing that supports the execution of that strategy or not? And thinking about that in the way that a, a family would or a generation would, and we're, we're not going to saddle you with debt in the meantime, that, that would put us in a position where we, we might have to do things that you don't want to do. I, I don't want to do, but we got to do them no matter what. Well, let's just not put ourselves in that position. That's a great story about AMF, um, and, and I think it's a good way to start talking a little more about Markel Ventures. So it's really easy to sit from the outside and look at Berkshire and say, "Well, look, look at what Berkshire did." And you know, they have this insurance business, and they bought, bu bu they built up this large stable of non-insurance businesses, and 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 it is a behemoth now. Um, you know, Markel now has a really eclectic group of businesses ranging from baking equipment to a manufacturer of dredges, for example. So, I mean, aside from just, you know, Berkshire having a model that looks similar and, and has, has been really successful with, I'm interested, how do you think it's helped pro propel Markel's success to have both the insurance side and the, you know, owning business side? Um, you oh, know, uh, yeah, yeah, I, th I think it's, it's spectacularly important. And here's where it matters. So, for instance, getting back to the discipline of what it takes to be good at insurance and the fact that this is not a business that you would ascribe a, a big moat to or 
franchise value or brand. I mean, on any given day, insurance companies are price takers, not price makers. So one of the ways in which you develop a very good financial record over many, many years in the realm of insurance is you're willing to walk away from business or not write it when the, when the prices are too low. Well, the good news is for the people of Markel, um, we are not tied to only that business and only that product line. So we don't have one insurance line. We have 100 insurance lines. Um, and that gives courage and sustenance to any given underwriter at any given point in time. They don't need to write that next policy if they don't think it's priced well because they have other parts of the insurance organization that they know will, will you know, get their back a little bit. They have the long-term uh, record of the in investment operation that you know, they know that the, the company is going to be okay because we have that pillar to stand on as well. And for the last 15 years, we've had a, a growing uh, stream of cash flow and income that is not connected to insurance at all that they know keeps the Markel Corporation robust and resilient and viable such that on any given day, if, uh, if there's nothing smart to be done, then don't do things. Now, days when there are smart things to be done, do them and do them a lot and, and run. But, but the ability to play different notes and have that accordion dollars go in and out and not be completely dependent on any one thing, is, it's, it's part of the reason why we have it. it we didn't just stumble upon it. We, we, we designed the system to create exactly that. And we were certainly well served by seeing the example of Berkshire and how Buffett thought about it and how, you know, how he designed that system to create an environment where this is the sort of thing that can happen. You mentioned in, in, in the response to that question that insurance is not something that you, you know, think about having a moat around the business. And, um, you know, that it's, it's incredible that you, whether it's Berkshire or, um, or Markel or, or Allegheny, for example, another one of our holdings has been able to compound capital to that degree in an industry where, you know, you know, you're a price taker as a, uh, so I'm interested in maybe you're paying it a little bit of short thrift in the sense that culture has to be part of that insurance moat, right? And, and maybe it's not a, maybe it's not a, you know, 20, 20 feet wide and, you know, a hundred feet deep. But maybe that there's something about the culture of Markel's insurance side that has allowed the whole company to be a compounder, um, even despite the industry that it's operating in. Well, I think that culture is, in, in our case, uh, deep expertise about what you're underwriting. So this isn't just uh, a commodity form of insurance that a lot of people would be in. I mean, we'll, we'll do things like if, uh, so, so are you in Los Angeles? If the uh, Los Angeles Art Museum is uh, has, has a tragedy, but maybe it's from the Boston Museum, well, that art that's being moved from Boston to Los Angeles, somebody ensures that, and, and somebody knows the movers that are capable of doing that, and what sort of temperature and humidity conditions the art should be stored on while it's moving around and what the security should be all along the way. That, that's an example of a product line that we, had, we do at Markel and we have that expertise. So we help people like that, the museums, appropriately provide for the security of collections when they're moving around. So that's, that's an element of, of our culture, which is the technical understanding on display and the deep desire to help your customers. They have a problem, figure it out, Help, help solve it, help, help answer the question is, how do we safely get art from Boston to Los Angeles and back again? We have an insurance product which has technical expertise of what you're physically going to do way beyond just the handling, I mean, ju just the, you know, the financial aspects involved. And, and we, that's the nature of this organization a uh, hundred times over in, in, a, in a lot of places. You look at some of the other uh, insurance companies that you mentioned, um, you know, they have their own form of technical expertise and deep understanding of the risks they're accepting, how to make those risks less risky, 
which is a win-win for them as the insurance company and for the customer because it lowers the cost of what it, it is to protect against that risk if you actually lower the risk of the bad thing happening in the first. So just living that every single day throughout the organization, day after day after day after day, that, that's what builds a culture of discipline and execution in an insurance business, which can produce pretty good returns over time. I don't think any conversation with a, a public company CEO would be complete without mentioning um, ESG and the huge demand, both from an investment side and from a cultural, you know, kind of cultural perspective to address any number of issues within our society. But I'm interested, you know, in, you know, insurance, you're always underwriting things going wrong. And so you have a lot of experience in modeling things and thinking about what can go wrong. I'm wondering if, if anything about this, you know, kind of ESG focus that, that that's being kind of pushed at you in, in multiple directions, do you have to change anything about the way you operate to, to address that? Or is this something you've thought of, you know, especially on the environmental side for decades, and it's really not that different going forward? Yeah, I, I would say um, it, it's sort of like back what Bezos said, that the customers always want things that are better, faster, and cheaper. Well, and ESG, I think, are new words and new labels to describe old things. So the idea that this is a business that's going to persist and go from generation to generation and generations that are not even named Markel. Well, if we're not sustainable, if we're not behaving in such a way that our customers want to do business with us again, that our employees are not you know, having sustained careers where they're learning things, where our communities are not you know, having something happen, you know, whether it's pollution or things of that nature, which would be externalities, which co would cause them to look at the business and say, I'm not just sure we want that. Um, we have always and forever acted in a way that we thought increased the odds that we're going to be here again tomorrow and next month and next year and the year after that. And uh, as a couple of illustrations of that, I, I, I tell the story. You know, when I grew up, I grew up in the Delaware Valley and I was raised as a Quaker. And the old joke about the Quakers in Philadelphia was that they came to America to do good and they did well. Uh, they ended up being a community of pretty successful business people. And I think one of the fundamental principles and one of the fundamental reasons why Quakers in general were, were such good business people was because they, as a, as a matter of religious faith, you treat everybody equally and you recognize the inherent human dignity of each individual that you're dealing with. And they're a fellow child of God. So they get the same deal. They get the same treatment. Quakers were way ahead of their times in, in merchant communities where instead of haggling over goods or haggling over prices, Quakers sold things at a fixed price. And it didn't matter who you were. When you walked in that door, you got the same price as everybody else. Now to, to digress just a little bit, think about our healthcare system and think about the absolute challenges of what's going on in the, in the healthcare system. Well, if you gave me a magic wand and said, okay, Tom, it's your job to try to fix healthcare in our country, what would you do? Well, I think I might go back to my old Quaker roots and say, you know what, when you walk in off the street to that hospital and you get an MRI, I don't care who your insurance provider is. I don't care whether you're insured, not insured, who it is, whatever, but this is how much an MRI costs at our hospital and not have pricing differentials for people based on you know, their circumstances coming in for, as to who their carrier is or, or who there isn't. So as a simplifying principle, getting to the notion of, of ESG, these are concepts that have been around for a long time. You, you see it in the Quaker community. A another example that I, that I would cite, there's a wonderful book called The Chocolate Wars that a, that a good friend of mine named Judd Norman gave me. And Judd's someone I've met through the Berkshire Connection in Omaha, he's a Nebraska guy. And it was the story of Cadbury and uh, the growth of the chocolate industry in Victorian England. And the Cadburys were Quakers, and, and as were many of the sort of chocolate merchants of that time. And if you went and studied the history of that era, uh, the opioid crisis that we face today had an analog in gin in Victorian England. And, you know, 
people drank a little too much gin and the Victorian uh, factory disasters and things of that nature. So the Cadbury's and some of those Quaker merchants uh, did a couple of things. One, chocolate in and of itself is has, has a good bit of sugar in it. And I can tell you that firsthand because I eat some every day. It's a fundamental principle for me. Uh, so just like alcohol is based on sugar, well, so is chocolate. It, it satisfies a, a sweet tooth craving. So you can sort of sub out a little chocolate for a little gin. They thought people would be better off on account of that. Secondly, they moved the factories from sort of crowded urban conditions out from the city center a little bit, created a little more air space. Gardenies, uh, they had uh, company doctors who helped take care of the, of the workforce, more, more ventilation, things of that nature. So when we see cutting edge Silicon Valley companies uh, having cafeterias and food on site to, to do the workforce, that, that's not a new idea. It, it was done 150 years ago by the Quaker chocolate merchants uh, like Cadbury. So studying history and, and seeing some frame of reference and seeing the fundamentally sound business idea that being good at eating, but taking care of the environment, being good at ass, behaving in such a way that's sustainable, being good at G, which speaks to integrity and, and management not acting as a bad fiduciary for your shareholders. I mean, that, that goes back to the Bible and, and uh, you know, the, the, um, this is the story of the talents. You know, and the guy gives the, the one servant one talent and five talent and 10 talents, the behavior. I mean, that's, that's principal agency contract law <laughs> being taught to you over thousands of years of tradition. These are not new concepts. Um, but despite the fact that they're not new concepts, they get, they get rebranded and, and reprocessed every once in a while for a variety of reasons. And as uh, one, one friend of mine said in a statement that's both very optimistic and very pessimistic at the same time, he said, eternal truths are always rediscovered. Now that's optimistic. The, the pessimistic part of that means they're all, also always bad. And I think we are in a cycle where we are relearning some eternal truths, but we're also forgetting some. And, and that is the nature of human existence. My guess is that the people who you work with and who work for you benefit a lot from these anecdotes and these stories and these lessons. I'm interested in what, you know, whenever you decide to, to, you know, retire and, and, and do whatever it is that, 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 that you want to do post post being in the office every day, what do you think you'd want your legacy to be if, you know, uh, on the Markel Corp? Well, I want the legacy that, uh, yeah, Tom was really good at that. And he, and he helped us continue it to the fifth generation Markels. And, you know, when I started here at Markel, I think we had about 350 people. We now have 20,000 people. So there are more people that, and then I'm speaking of our employees, that are taking care of their families and living productive lives on, on account of what we do. And if we keep going the way we're going, we're, we're going to get there. And that means 10, 20, 50 years from now, when it may not me be being the one doing it, that it's not, it's not 20,000 people anymore. It's 50,000 or a hundred thousand or, or a million. So if we keep going down those paths uh, and we keep going down them after I'm gone, that, that means what I did worked. And maybe quickly on the insurance side, you know, I think there's this old adage that, you know, one of the ways to stay in the game in insurance is, is not blowing up, right? Just stay in the game. Don't take any risks that blow you up. But I'm also interested, you know, as you think about your legacy, is there any way that you can help this organization be able to look around the corner for whatever is going to come, whatever your customers are going to want. You said, you know, the, the Bezos idea, like your customers are going to want it faster and cheaper. How do you, how do you maintain that, um, you know, consistency and, and avoid blowing up, but also look around the corner? Because I just feel like in insurance, that's got to be a really hard thing to do. Well, it, it is, but uh, acknowledging how hard it is and the fact that it is an important challenge helps you to stay on your toes a little, a little bit and, and be better at it than you would otherwise be. So uh, nobody takes that for granted around here. 
And we, we always operate with some degree of paranoia and concern about exactly what you talk about, which, which helps you to deal with that a little bit better. Secondly, um, you know, we have not just one line, so a hundred different lines and those get repriced every day. So every day, if you know something different than you did the day before, you know what? Um, the, the entire insurance portfolio that you wrote, and let's just assume for simplification pur purposes, they're one year policy terms, and most of them are. Well, one 365th of whatever stupid thing you did in the past has now expired. And now you get to reprice that. And, and after day two, you know, you get two 365ths at it. And you keep doing that, you keep iterating, you keep improving, which means you're compounding every day as you do that. And that's what you do. That's why you go to work every day. That's why this is fascinating. That's why it's fun. You cannot do the same thing you did yesterday and expect that will continue to work into perpetuity. It won't. You must be creative. You must be flexible. You must be adaptive and recognize that the world changes. But the good news is, the, the business is designed to acknowledge that and give you a, a daily option to reprice and reframe and redefine. Specifically on the ability to be adaptable and flexible, are there any things that come to mind that you've had to rethink or change your position on meaningfully as it relates to building a business over time? Anything that you've learned that, you know, you look back in hindsight and say, I really didn't understand this 10 or 15 years ago. And now I've really had to rethink, you know, how, how I, how, how I, like how I view the best way to build a business. Well, um, as my, as my great friend, Chris Davis, quoting a Chinese proverb once said to know and not to do is not to know. So all of these things we're talking about, the principles are very basic. They are one Oh one type things. When you're, a certain, when you're 20 years old or 25 years old and you're an undergraduate or you're getting an MBA, you can read the book and you can see these things written down. You can listen to people try to, try to teach you about them. There's only so much of it that you're going to be able to absorb and know given your 20 or 25 years of experience on planet earth, how it really works. The question is when you're 26 and 36 and 46 and 56, are you cumulatively building on that knowledge and being better at executing that stuff you learned back in 101? It's, it's, it's not new principles. That's why they call them principles. But the execution and, and, and what things really mean and, and how integrity plays out, th those, are, those are things that I wouldn't say I've changed my mind on, but I certainly have refined my technique and recognized that whatever techniques I used when I was 49, 39, 29, you know, the, the, those, I, I should be getting better at that rather than worse from cumulative experience of working on it every day. Got it. So it's mostly about having the principles and being able to execute them versus, you know, developing new principles that, that would be your, you know, your, you know, your understanding that you learned over the last couple of decades. Absolutely. And um, as, as you can't get through a, a conversation with a guy who went to UVA and is a Virginian without talking about Thomas Jefferson to some degree, despite whatever degree of uh, honor or dishonor he's held in by the rest of the world. And he said, you know, in, in, in matters of fashion, go with the tide. In matters of principle, hold your ground. So if, if you find yourself having to adopt new principles on a regular basis, you you're either not very good at uh, describing principles or they weren't principles to begin with. Principles should be pretty steady. They should be pretty stable. Techniques, fashion, that changes. That, that's, that, is a, that is a tactical level thing, not a strategic level thing. Well, we, we could probably do this for another two hours, but I, I recognize that you have a, a company to, to co-manage. So maybe we'll just finish with the, the, get, the question that we, we ask all of our guests, which is, what do you think is the most underappreciated or misunderstood aspect of your business that either investors or, you know, people, uh, you know, people who know Markel might not really appreciate about the company, um, whether it's culture or business or wh whatever, what do you think, what do you think is most underappreciated? 
Well, I think there have been periods of time when people have held Markel in very high esteem. And it has been, you know, we've, we've had three, five, seven, eight, 10, 12 years in a row where things have been really good. So you can, you can point to the record and you can point to the numbers and you can say, wow, look how smart they are and look how good they are and how all that stuff works. There have been periods of time at Markel where we've gone through some fallow periods or done some big deals and there's been some indigestion and some times when uh, you know, it might not be obvious that uh, those guys know what they're doing or not. And I would say we're, we're sort of coming out of one of those periods right now where we've not covered ourselves in glory in a couple of areas around here over the last couple of years. Internally, we feel like we've made a lot of progress, learned some painful but expensive uh, lessons, and that we have uh, things going pretty well around here. And the, the, the market might not be aware of that. So there's nothing we could do about that except put the numbers on the books, quarter by quarter, year by year. Um, and as, as my friend, as my friend Chad Rose says, um, in, in, in the investment business, and I'll broaden this to all to Mark Allen, the whole business at any given point in time, you look either smarter or dumber than you really are. And I've, I've been around here 30 some years. So I've seen periods when I think the market has thought of us as maybe smarter than we really were. And, I've, I've seen periods of time when the market thinks of us as dumber than we really are, but that underlying trend line over long periods of time has been an up and to the right sort of graph. And we go to work every day and I think we work on good principles and I think we apply them with integrity and, and we apply them to the best of our ability. And I have a fair amount of confidence that will continue to work out pretty well. Well, that, that's a great way to close it because you basically just described like how to create a compounder. So Tom, uh, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, uh, we appreciate you appreciate you taking the time with us today. Thank you. It's been fun. Thanks, Tom. Be well. That's it for our show today. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. We recognize that you have a lot of different podcast choices and we appreciate you spending the time with us. We are continually working to make the show better and we would love your feedback. The more candid and honest, the better. And if you have any suggestions for public company CEOs you would like to see on the podcast, please let us know. And of course, warm intros are always appreciated. Please feel free to email us at podcast at co-streetcapital.com with your comments or suggestions. Thanks again and stay tuned for the next episode of Compounders, Anatomy of a Multibiker.